we have a station on, on YouTube. If you take that prayer card and and search for uh, search for uh, my name, and you look for that brightly colored photo there, and uh, <coughs> there's uh, our the video that we showed in Sunday school. You can see that again. Uh, and have, I've got to, I've been taught once how to. Uh, do the sound in this situation, and, and obviously I didn't do a really good job in Sunday school, so I ask your forgiveness there. Uh, but you can see that again on, on the YouTube channel there, and I do put up the sermons. Uh, I'm going to try to talk to you this morning uh, out of uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians is one of my most favorite books. The preacher did ask me to give you just a quick shot again for anybody that wasn't in Sunday school as to what we are doing. Uh, my name is John Hallman. My wife, Denise, and our daughter, Emma, are with me this morning. And we believe God has not only called us, but uniquely prepared us to go to Europe and plant a church to reach both the U.S. military station there, Lord willing, in a place called Baumholder, Germany. Uh, and that is not 100% set in stone yet, but we believe that's where the Lord wants us to go. Uh, but if we don't go... Uh, we don't go there, we'll go there with two other opportunities that we know about. But we're going to start a church specifically to reach the U.S. military, but also to reach the locals outside the base as well. And so maybe I didn't even do a good job of explaining that this morning. When I said I spoke other languages, clearly I only need to speak English to reach the U.S. military. But uh, if you're going to reach German, it's going to be best if you speak to them in German. If you're going to reach somebody. And for us, you know, we, we can't imagine the preacher made some, some playful jokes about y'all needing a translator because I came from Mississippi. But, uh, you know, if you travel that distance, we traveled six hours to get here, like six hours and ten minutes. If you travel that distance in Europe, you're going to go through one or more different language groups. And so most everybody there speaks more than one language. Uh, and speaks it well enough to communicate in it. Like I speak enough Spanish to be able to get a green tea, uh, excuse me, a, a, a burrito verde, which is a green burrito. That's the sauce they put on it with chicken and a sweet tea when I'm in a Mexican restaurant, you know. But uh, they speak a little more of other languages than that. Most of them have to speak four languages. So in speaking French, when we've had exchange students come to Mississippi, if, they, if I didn't speak their language, I could ask them if they spoke French, and, and I have yet to have one not be able to converse with me in French. So uh, we believe, as I said with previous, the Lord has helped let us start four churches before. Uh, we've led about 17 high schoolers to the Lord during this past school year, hoping to see that many more this school year. So we covet your prayers. Our goal is to be on the field in the fall of 2021 and to have our first service November 7th of 2021. We'll see if the Lord uh, brings that to pass. We're trusting Him either way. Amen. Amen. But I want to talk to you this morning about, I want to encourage you at the same time, I, I, I want to be used of the Lord to let us know that you know, sometimes we sit around and complain about the current situation, right? We complain about how uh, so much animosity we see on TV and, and open borders and, and all the various things we can complain about. But this comes as no surprise to the Lord. Uh, the Lord is still omniscient. He still knows everything. So it may be a surprise to us, but it's no surprise to Him. And just like uh, uh, Uncle Mordecai said to Esther and for such a time as this. If God doesn't use you, if you don't let God use you, He's going to use somebody else to accomplish His purposes in this time. For such a time as this, we're coming to the kingdom. And for us, that will be the kingdom of God, and He wants to use us today. When we look at the book of Philippians, we see Christ our life, we see Christ our Lord, we see Christ our love in chapter 3, and Christ our lot, our supply, everything we need is for us, is given to us through Jesus Christ. But I want us to look in chapter 2, Christ our love. And just an odd question. Is the piano still turned on? Okay, good. I may need that in a second. I don't play, but I'm going to play at it, all right? <clears throat> Let's, um, I, I want to read uh, beginning in verse number 1, and I'm going to read down to the first part of verse 16, uh, if you'd be so kind to read with me there. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy. Now, I'm going to go ahead and explain that to you. Uh, we talk about we love somebody from the bottom of our heart. Okay, well, this, this is written in an Eastern mindset, and, and they love you from their 
bottles. Okay, so it sounds odd to us in a Western mindset, but this is basically like we would say, if there's any consolation, if, there's, if God can consoles, does he console you in your time of trouble? Of course he does. Uh, is there any comfort of love? Is there comfort in Jesus Christ? Well, of course there is. Is there any fellowship? Do you, do you get to rub shoulders with other believers in Christ and it, does it lift you up? Well, of course it does. If there, is there any heart of mercy? Is there mercy in Christ Jesus, mercy in the believers? Well, of course, there are. these are rhetorical statements that we know the answer is these things exist. So verse number two, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love. Notice this word, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus let that sink in for just a second there are over 200 names for God found in scripture but at the name of Jesus the Bible says every knee should bow of things in heaven things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God that worketh in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputes, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Doesn't that sound like what we see on the news today? Yeah. Among whom ye shine as lights, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I've not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of being here today. I thank you for the kindness this church has shown us, Lord, from the good supper to the accommodations to the joy and love they uh, bestowed upon us this morning. Lord, I pray that you would take control of my mouth. Lord, I believe you've given me your message. I pray that you give me your mouth that I might say it in the way that you'd have it said. Lord, I pray that you would do what John Altman could never do, and that's speak to the hearts of people this morning, Lord. If there be one here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, then I pray that today would be the day of, day of their new birth, and, and the church would need to go back down to the creek for another baptism, Lord. But for those of us here today that know beyond any shadow of a doubt that our names are written in the book of life, Lord, I pray that you would purge us of sin, and prune us of unfruitfulness that we might be used of thee to bring forth a revival in our land. Of course, in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. You see, we believe our land in particular and our world in general is very ripe for three things. A revolution. I don't know about you, but I'm 51 years old. I, don't not, I do not remember the animosity that I see on the news screen today in the land. I believe we're ripe for the rapture. There's nothing in this book that has to happen before Jesus Christ comes back. He can very well come back before I finish preaching today. And even so, come quickly again. Or for a revival. Now, when I say a revival, most of us think of a, a meeting that lasts when I was a boy, eight days. Now, sometimes, I, I saw a sign on a, on a church the other day, we're having revival Sunday one day. That's not the revival I think we're right for. I'm talking about a revival where the church gets thoroughly right with God and then the community comes to Christ and the county and the country. I'm talking about our country was born. I, I preached a sermon called His Story in, in Our History 
And I can show you from history that our country was born more out of a revival we call the Great Awakening than it was out of a revolution. In the midst of that revolution, George Washington, who describes himself as a sinner saved by grace, decided he wasn't scripturally baptized and had a Baptist preacher named John Gano baptize him in a river. Those men were first and foremost Christians. And I think we're right. And, and we get to thinking that, well, God couldn't send a revival today. That's what they thought in Jonathan Edwards' day. That's what they thought in D.L. Moody's day. That's what they thought in, you've probably never heard the name, but Jeremiah Lanfear, who's a, just a, a Christian businessman that started a prayer meeting. And you'll never believe it, Brother King, but 10,000 businessmen at one time in the 1800s closed business for an hour in New York City to pray. Amen. We didn't think a revival could come in the 1920s. But it did. We need one today. It's been a hundred years since we've had a revival to the extent that came that got us through World War II. We need a revival. Holding forth, verse 16 says, the word of life. But that's what we're doing. There's a, there's a couplet. When you see couplets in Scripture, they're often very important. There's a couplet, two things that go together. And, and you find it in Luke, in Romans, in Colossians. 1 John and also in the book of James, you find this couplet, word and deed. Word and deed. I'm going to say it one more time. Word and deed. People need to hear your words, brother, but they need to see that our lives give credence or believability to the words that we are giving them. I talk to young people today. Most millennials do not want to be in church this morning. And as I look around, there are very few millennials here today. Millennials don't want to be in church. Now, it's always easy, before I tell you their reason, I want you to know that I am reasonably aware, Brother Craig, that it's easy to sit on the side and point at the problems in somebody's life rather than get right yourself. Just like Monday morning, we know why the team should have won on Saturday if they just made this call or that call, the game would have gone differently, right? And so it's easy to Monday, Monday morning quarterback people. But the Bible tells us to live lives that are above reproach. In fact, it said in the words of Scripture, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, avoid all appearance of evil. Instead, most of us, hopefully not y'all, but most Christians in these United States live a why must I do that type of a Christianity and why can't I do the other type of Christianity. We don't, we don't want to give up anything that we determine is fun and we don't want to become something that we may deem is not fun, even though what's amazing, we're like, you know the Bible calls us sheep. And I saw some sheep down the road here. I came in on 62 yesterday. I guess it would be that way. I saw some sheep, I don't know how far, one curve or another down through there. I saw some sheep. And I don't know if any of y'all have ever been around sheep, but sheep are stupid. Okay? Sheep are stupid. If that sheep is not accustomed to you being with her Every day, she could be dying with worms, and you have life-giving medicine that will kill those worms. You'll have to fight that sheep to give her that medication. A sheep could be dying of starvation, and if that sheep is not accustomed to your presence. You can't even feed the sheep. That's what the Lord calls us. We're the sheep of his pasture. And if we don't take the time to know our Lord, to spend time with our Lord, that's why we see things that He wants for us, and we see them as some sort of evil that we're afraid of. Where if we would take the time to know the Lord, we realize He just wants the best for us. Now, Emma Joy is probably the best shepherd in the family because she would go out and just sit and wait on those sheep. And they would come around her and then maybe not let her touch her. And within a shorter period of time, Emma Joy had all those sheep eating from her hands because she spent time with them daily. But <clears throat> we're talking about word and deed, right? 
We're talking about the world needing to see not only hear not only our words, but see our deeds to give our words believability. We act so often like the old farmer and his wife in our relationship with the Lord. The farmer and his wife got married as a young couple. They had a regular cab pickup truck, and she sat right up against them every time they went to town. Then babies came along, and they were between them. And then babies grew up and left home, but she's still over there by the door. And one day on the way to town, she, she starts to cry, Brother Blanket. She said, you, you just don't love me anymore. You, you don't sit close like we used to. And the old farmer said, I haven't moved. She slipped to the other side of the truck. Guys, that's the way our relationship with the Lord is too often. The Lord is sitting, waiting on you to spend time with Him. But He's just waiting. Because so many things become more important to us than building that relationship with the Lord. If we're going to be able to hold forth the word of life, we've got to have our lifeline with the Lord. He is our Lord. But everything that we need is in Him. We need to get along. Now, it seems to be one of the happiest churches I've been in in a long time. From picking on somebody that forgot to do the devotional this morning. <laughs> and I loved it. She said I could go home and get treated this way. <laughs> well, there's a lot of love here. But that love, if you go back to the first paragraph, the church should be in one accord. I said I was going to play the piano. The church, now I can't really play the piano, but I, 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 know, I know a little. That's what the church should sound like, right? Sometimes we sound like that. When we sound like that, what's the problem? Because if you're here this morning and you're a part of the church, then you at least profess to know Christ as your Lord and your Savior, right? Say amen if you know the Lord. Okay, so if you know the Lord and you're not getting along with me or the preacher or your spouse or anybody else who claims to know the Lord, the problem is one and most often both of us are not listening to the Lord. It is the Lord who gives us that music. He is the mode of our symphony. He is the one that makes us make music together. And we each and corporately have to keep that relationship with him. That's what he says here. Fulfill you my joy that you be of one accord. One accord. That's not talking about a Japanese car, amen. It's talking about making music together as the church. If there's discord, that's where I just laid my hand down flat. That doesn't sound very pretty at all. When these ladies played these instruments earlier, it sounded nice, didn't it? That's the way the church is supposed to look to the world. He is the mode, or the only way that we have to be in accord. It's our individual relationship with Him. Because if you're listening to the Lord, and Brother Bobby's listening to the Lord, then y'all are going to be on the same line. Is it not true? It's true. If we're both listening to the Lord, there can be no discord between us if we are both listening to the Lord. The problem is, I, I was once a part of a church split. I know y'all can't believe that, but I was in a church that split. And the preacher asked me what I thought he needed to do. And I said, you don't want me to answer that question. He said, yeah, I do. That's why I asked you. I said, I think you need to take the key down there to the bank and tell them to sell it to a group of people that want to serve Jesus because neither side in this split is serving God where both sides are just serving themselves. And it is dishonoring to God and it is ruining His name in the community. If that's church, people don't want anything to do with it. And it's because we're not in accord. And we're in accord. It's not that you and I don't need to work on, on, you know, we don't need to sit and have long conversations about how you defended me and all this kind of junk, right? We need to sit and get right with Jesus Christ. And if I'm right with Christ and you're right with Christ, there will be accord between us. Not only do I want you to see, in order for us to hold forth the word of life 
in order for us to, to, to complete that great commission, right? None of us, when we talk about holding forth the word of life, we understand that's an allusion to the great commission. He didn't, he didn't say, go take the gospel to every creature. But that's what he's alluding to, is it not? We as the church, what is the great commission? Tell me what the great commission is. All right. There you go. Uh, Brother King got it there from Matthew, right? We got it recorded in Matthew. He started with go ye therefore. I'm, I'm going to back up one verse before that. It says all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. We see the word therefore. We need to know what it's there for. We're going on his power, his authority. In Acts 1.8 it says ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, the sign that they received the Holy Ghost was not that they could speak. Now, I can, I can preach in other tongues if you wanted me today, but it would be much better for me to preach to you in English. I don't see a lot of French speakers before me. I don't see a lot of Icelandic speakers before me. All right? I haven't worked and prepared it in Spanish, so I couldn't even do that if I wanted to today. It would be better for me to preach to you in English. The, the sign that those guys were filled, those guys and girls, ladies, were filled with the Holy Spirit was not that they used those other languages, but the entire church was in the community sharing the gospel of Christ. There were 120 people in the upper room. That, that Holy Spirit is gave, what gave them the boldness to speak. Okay? You know, the, 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 it's His power, His authority, His power, His strength, and His passion. I mean, you got to admit, when you think about it, Brother Brian, everything's going on in the world today, you got to get mad. Whichever side, as Democrat, Republican, somebody's mad about something if you look at it. But how did Jesus look at the sinners out there? Come on, tell me. How did Jesus look at the sinners? As sheep having no shepherd. What did that tell you about sheep? They're stupid. That's the way we need to look at them because they're afraid. If, if they're afraid, uh, if you're if you're a Christian today and you work with lost people, they're going to say things that should offend a Christian. Do you know why? It's kind of a double-edged sword. They're testing to see if you are a Christian, and they really want to find that there, there's truth there. They've heard all this garbage. There is no absolute truth. And they're going to test you to see if it's real. To see if your walk is real. The only way that walk's going to be real is if you have that relationship with the Lord. I'm not talking about being saved. Clearly, I'm talking to saved people at this point. I'm talking about for saved people to have that right relationship with the Lord. You know, if, if I offend my wife, I know it is. Now, I try not to do it, but I know it instantly, and I'm trying to repair that relationship, right? And that's the way we need to be with the Lord so that we can hand hold forth the word of life. So we're supposed to take it to, 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 in his power, his authority, his power, his strength, his passion, his love. Preach repentance and remission of sins. That's what Luke tells us. To every person of every people in every place. That's holding forth the word of life. None of you would argue that we need to preach the word. And we as humans, we want to go do something. But before you can properly do something, you've got to be what God wants you to be. We've got to have that accord. Not only is he the accord, he's the mode or the method of our symphony, but he is the model for you. If you're saved and baptized this morning, you are a saint of God. Or you are called to be a saint of God. What do you mean? If I'm saved, I ain't. No. A saint of God is someone who is right, the saved, baptized members of the church, in right standing with Christ and his church. That's why Paul addresses some, some of these books to the saints that be I. In other books, he writes to those that are called to be saints because they weren't where they needed to be. Your model is not Brother Bob. Now, from the times we've talked on the phone and the times we've prayed together, I feel like you've got a great pastor here. Amen. All right? But Brother Bobby's not your model. The Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say, let this mind be in you, which was in your pastor. 
It said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Imagine this. The God of the universe. John 1 tells us that it was Jesus. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And you go on down. It's talking about the Word. All things by the Word was made. And without the Word was not anything made that was made. You go on down to verse 14. It says, the Word was made flesh. and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is the only one we've gotten with the Father. Full of grace and truth. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the Creator. Jesus knelt down and formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. Je Jesus put Adam to sleep and took his rib and made woman. It came from the rib, not from the foot. They ain't going to walk over them, not from the head. They're not going to walk over us, but from the rib, right there. Jesus made. And the God of the universe, Emma Joy, was born in a third world country when she was born in the nicest hospital in that country. My boys were all born in the nicest hospital in Knoxville, Tennessee at the time. Our Lord Jesus Christ was born in a barn and laid in a manger. I didn't know till I was an adult because we didn't use the term manger on the little farm my daddy had. But that's a trough. The creator of the universe was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a trough in a barn. For you. That's why he says, back up before there, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. It's not about John. It's not about Jason. It's not about Mason. It's not about Bobby. It's not about Craig. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our model. He's the model for all saints. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery. Now, if I go down the road, Brother Brian, and I say, hey, my name's Brian. I was baptized a couple weeks ago down the creek down here. I've just stolen his identity, have I not? But when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. You might not understand it, but everybody listening understood. He said, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the flesh. Okay? And that was not robbery because he was, in fact, God in the flesh. And yet, he became obedient unto death. Now, Madonna said when I was in high school that a crucifix was a sexy thing. That's the most idiotic thing I believe I've ever heard somebody say. Cicero was a Roman leader, and he said that no one should have to die the death of the cross. But Christ went to that for you and for me. You know, a lot of people, Brother Roger, didn't make it to the cross because the whipping they took in advance would leave their intestines at their feet and they couldn't make it till God got them. They died in rags. But our Lord went through that for you and for me. If we're going to hold forth the word of life, we not only have to be in accord here, we have to be following the humility that our Lord Jesus Christ showed us. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Not only is he the, the manner or the mode of our symphony and the model for we as saints, but he is the master of all souls. Look down there in verse 10. Back up to verse 9. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven. Read Hebrews 11. Old Testament saints are there because of what Christ did on the cross. My Father is there because of what Christ did on the cross. Every knee in heaven has already bowed of things on earth. There's a 50-50 shot as to whether you're going to... Jesus knows who's going to bow and who's not, the Bible tells us. This is a 50 50 shot. If you're breathing, I think you still have a shot to be saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. Things under the earth. Where's hell? The Bible says it's under the earth. We're on hell. I've heard people say, Well, I'll get out of hell for judgment. No, the Bible says death and hell delivered up the dead. From hell, they will be judged. And from hell, they will profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
to the glory of God the Father. He is the master of the universe, the master of all souls. The question is not what our friends, neighbors, countrymen, even enemies and people that we dislike be saved. Well, the question is, will they be saved? The question is not, will they admit that Jesus Christ the Lord is the Lord? The question is, will they admit it in time to miss hell and gain heaven? They're going to confess it. He's the motivation for our servants. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only. Have you ever worked with that guy, Jason? When the boss is there, he's a hard worker. But as soon as the boss disappears, he's sitting over there doing nothing. And for some reason, the boss thinks that guy's great. Now, you're sitting there working steady the whole time. When I first came back from the mission field, I uh, worked with two fellows, and they worked with a guy that, that I grew up with. In fact, I grew up calling him uncle. Him and my, he and my dad built houses together. And he had to go to town to buy some parts, and I'm up here fixing a, we're doing a remodel job, so I'm, I'm trying to fix a, a problem with the drywall. And these two cats sit down when, when we call him Pawpaw now because he's so old. When Pawpaw left to go to town, these two cats sit down. I said, what you doing? Oh, Paul Paul understands. We, we, we don't work when he ain't here to tell us what to do. And I said, you sure about that? Yeah. I said, well, I'm just going to keep working. So I went on about my business. When they got back, Paul Paul wanted to know why they hadn't gotten something done. I said, they said you knew they sit down when you went to town. I'm like, whoo, those two fellas won't fight, you know. They're so mad. I told them, I said, you told me he knows you sit down. Apparently you were mistaken, were you not? <laughs> we don't get busy when the preacher's near. We obey the Lord 24-7. What does the psalmist write? The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Beholding the good and the evil. Wherefore, my beloved, not as, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean to, to work it out, you know? There, there's a saying. I, I went through a place years ago called Paris Island, South Carolina. When I showed up, I weighed about 218. When I left, about 13 weeks later, I weighed 163. <clears throat> They said it's where they make Marines. And they say once a Marine, always a Marine. My wife never been in the Marine Corps, but she says things that I learned in the Marine Corps because she hears me say. Adapt, improvise, and overcome. That's something we learn. You, just, you, don't, you don't say you can't. You figure out how to get it done. All right? Well, you're saved this you have more power than just the book. If you weren't in the Marine Corps, that's the most decorated Marine ever. He went in as a private, and he's got three stars on his gravestone. Because you have the Almighty God living in your soul. And you need to work Him out to your hands. It takes that, like we talked about in Sunday school, that that moment by moment surrender so that I do the things that please Him. Work Him out to my feet so that I only go to those places that would please Him. Work Him out to my mouth so that I only say those things that will please Him. Work Him out to my mind so that I only think those things that will please Him. To my eyes gentlemen, that I only look at those things that will please him. He's the motivation. You know, when I, I feel like though I'm fat and 51, that if it came down to it, I could still get the heart of that Marine out from my hands and feet so I do what I need to do. Believe it or not, fat and 51, I can still go run four or five miles if I decide to. I just don't decide too often, you know. <laughs> I did it just the other Sunday. I went around three miles of the Sunday a week ago. How long has it been since you worked Christ out through your hands, your feet, your eyes, and so forth? Come on. 
He's the motivation for our service. In fact, if you look here in the next verse, it says, for or because. It's God that worketh in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. In other words, if you want to do something right today, it is God Almighty who put that desire in your soul. If you manage to do something God wants you to do, it's not you. It's God working in you. The same for me. He said, what? He was talking about how many people we've led to the Lord in Sunday school. And, and he gave the credit to the right place. It's God. It's not John. John's just a mouthpiece. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. I think I got sidetracked earlier and I never told you why millennials didn't want to come to Christ. Didn't want to come to church. They say we're fake. In fact, as many of us are. It's hard to nod to that, but I saw a few nods. Hey, that, that's, that's where rubber meets the road. Hey, you don't want your children or your children's friends or your friends or your siblings or your parents or your co-workers to go to hell. Do you? So we, we need to be in the court. We need to be following that model. We need to recognize and tell them. I had a kid tell me last year that he was an, he was an atheist. And I said, nah, you're just fooling yourself. He said, what? I said, you're not an atheist. You're just trying to replace God as the Lord of your life with yourself. Well, I've never heard that before. I said, well, the Bible says you will confess him as Lord. See, I'm not telling you to be like John. I'm telling you to be like Jesus. Okay? Let me ask you this. And it's, it's 12 02. I'm going to shut up, I promise. Are you hoping for the word of life? Don't answer me. Don't nod your head. Right now, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says the Holy Spirit's coming to the world to convince the world of sin, or righteousness, and judgment to come. So the Holy Spirit is asking you right now. Y'all are expecting me, talking about the possibility of supporting me to go to Germany and hold forth the word of life. My question to you is, 85% of the churches in this country are either stalled or shrinking. Are you holding forth the word of life? More importantly than my question, I believe that's the Holy Spirit's question to you. I know the preacher's holding forth the word of life. Are you holding forth the word of life? Because God didn't call the preacher to reach Harrison, Arkansas, Old Arkansas, whatever that next little snow or something I ran through back down there. He called the church. And I'm looking at the church. It's not the building. It's the saints within. Are you holding forth the word of life? I submit to you as I close that if you're not holding forth the word of life, perhaps you're in discord with the body. Perhaps you're, you're, you're not following the model. Perhaps you're not surrendered to the master. Perhaps you have forgotten your motivation. Because the motivation is not to see... Honestly, motivation is not to see more people here on Sunday. The motivation is to see God glorified in their lives. So I'm going to shut up, and I'm going to ask the preacher and the pianist to come as I close. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of preaching here this morning. I pray that you have done what I cannot do, and that's touch hearts, Lord. And I pray if there's one here this morning that doesn't know for 100% if they're saved this morning, Lord, I pray they would come forward that they might uh, get with the preacher and, and get with the Word of God and find out if they're saved, Lord. For those of us who are saved, I pray that you would just purge us from sin, prune us of unfruitfulness, and help us to hold forth the Word of life. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. 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 Would you please stand with me this morning, please? And I'm going to ask the Palmer family if they would to go ahead and make their way back there by the door. We're going to stand. We're going to have a song of invitation. We have heard a joyful sound.